We've been going through um, an act. This is our third week. And basically, this series is designed to help every single one of us, whether you're from Victory or you're just joining us for, the, for a few weeks, from, uh, weeks, you, weeks now. Um, kung visitor kay dito, you're just a guest. This is our way of um, expressing and educating our members of who we are as a church community. See, it is important for us to understand who we are as a church family because that it will make sense why we have drums here. If you understand who we are as a church family, then you will understand why these banners, why these flags are all over us, why this, this, this facility is called Every Nation. And so our mission as a church community, okay, as part of an overall or a global movement called Every Nation, for those of you who don't know, Victory is here in the Philippines, but all around the world, okay, we have a family of churches known as Every Nation, okay? Now, the mission of Every Nation is this. We exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. In the past two weeks, Pastor Joey and Pastor Paolo talked to us about the first half of that mission statement. And today, we're going to be talking about campus ministry. And so I am so glad that um, we, uh, we are a part that, uh, that this church values campus ministry. In fact, if you may, um, I wouldn't be here if our church does not value campus ministry. Because the first time, not really the first, but I, I really got serious with my walk with God when I was in sophomore or a second year college student in UP Diliman. Anyone here, if you're from UP? I, I, was, I, I was introduced to Jesus um, when I was in second year college. Um, some of my friends who happened to be part of Victory invited me um, to small groups. And so I would attend, but then I would just attend just to hang out, sometimes with the food and sometimes, you know, just to get to know the ladies at that time. And so, hindi pa ako So, uh, But then, um, there was one time, July 31, 1997, they invited me to go to one of their events, one of the events then, and uh, Pastor Rice Brooks came over UP Diliman and he's supposed to deliver a, a talk about purpose, finding your purpose in God. And so I was supposed to attend um, a fraternity um, orientation because I wanted to be part of a fraternity in UP. And so, but that was in the evening. And since my classes ended in, at lunchtime, I still have the whole afternoon to burn. And so I thought, what if I just go to the event where my friends are asking me to go so that, you know, if there's air conditioning, I, per, perhaps I can get a comfortable seat there and just sleep on a corner and, you know, just wait for the orientation to happen. And so I went there to um, that place and um, there was music playing. But then when the pastor, Pastor Rice, started to speak about God, started to be, speak about Jesus and started to speak about purpose can only be found in Jesus Christ. And when I un somehow I understood what he said and it really hit home in my heart. And that's why right that day, I made a decision to submit my life to Christ. I made a decision to have Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. And I'm so grateful that as a church family, we have opportunities like that. We have outreaches like that in the campuses so that young people can hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I want to show you this picture. I found this from Pastor um, Gilbert Poliente's, you know, um, archives. Okay. Are you familiar with the guy in the middle? Okay. <laughs> That's our senior pastor, Pastor Joey Bonifacio in the 80s, okay? And so um, on his left is Pastor Steve Merle, the founder of Victory here in the Philippines. And on his right, there's Bishop Manny Carlos, for those of you who don't know, okay? So this was during the time that Pastor Joey was still a businessman. Um, pastor Steve, I think, is the only pastor at that time. And Pastor Manny Carlos just came back from the States, um, after his master's stint in the University of Virginia. And I'm just so grateful that we have leaders like these men who value young people. I just so appreciate because this was taken in UP Los Baños. I just so appreciate that they were willing to take time to go to a campus, so I guess kind of remote from here, but yet speak purpose into the lives of the students. Because how many of you know the next generation need to hear about Jesus Christ? The next generation need to be, need to know that they have a purpose, that they have a destiny, that there's a God who loves them. 
And so again, as a movement, this is one of the things that we do. This is one of the things that God has destined for us to do as a church family. And if you are here, you consider Victory as your home church. If you are here, you're saying, I want to be part of this church. And guess what? Whether whatever station your life you're in right now, in you, God has a role for you to play to reach the next generation. Whether you're a grandparent, whether you're an aunt, whether you're a parent here, whether you're a businessman, you're working for a call center, you're a student, guess what? In your spiritual DNA, God has designed you to have an impact in the campus, to have an impact in the next generation. And so, again, why do we need to reach the next generation? Why do we still need to reach the next generation? I have a few interesting statistics I want to show you. The first one is this one. If you look at the population of the Philippines today, this was taken June 30, 2015, fairly recent, okay? So this is the population of the Philippines, and it's interesting to note that a majority of our countrymen, okay, from 0 to 24 years old, about 52.7% of our country falls into this category, they're under 24 years old. 24 and below. Who among you here, you're 24 and below? Come on, lift up your hand. Who among you here, you still feel like you're 24 and below? <laughs> A lot of us, okay. So we still feel like that, okay? 56 million reasons. 56 million 708 and 109 plus plus reasons why we need to reach the campus. The reason why God wants us as a church to reach the campuses, to reach young people, is because of this 56 million young people in our nation. If you are here and you're, you're not from, from the Philippines, guess what? All over the world, about 70% of the world's population belongs to this category as well. That is why we need to reach the next generation. There's an interesting um, statistic from Gallup, and um, they made a survey of a lot of Christians, and they said this, 19 out of 20 Christians say that they got to know Christ before they were 25 years old. That's 95%. 95% of believers say God touched their heart. God spoke to them about Jesus, about the gospel, before they reached the, end, uh, the, the age of 25. Who among you here, you gave your life to Christ before you were 25? Just please read. Oh, look at that. It's a majority of us here. God speaks to young people. There's something about a young person's heart that is so open to the gospel. And that is why we need to, you know, take that opportunity and bring the gospel to the young people. Another, so it's a more interesting statistic. They say after the age of 21, or 25, one in 10,000 probability. 35, one in 50,000. 45, one in 200,000. 55, one in 300,000. 75, one in 700,000. Imagine that. And so I saw some of you, you didn't raise your hand earlier. Guess what? If you belong to any of these other categories, maybe you got saved when you were four, in your 40s or 50s. Guess what? You're a rare breed. <laughs> God took extra amounts of miracles <laughs> just so that you can hear the gospel. But if we're going to focus on that, on, to, on that top statistic over there, 95%. Of people give their lives to Christ when they are young. Shouldn't we take that opportunity as a church to really bring the gospel to them? And again, as I said, as a family, this is our job. This is our job. Can you look at the person right next to you and say, this is your job? That's our job. This is our job. You know, our nation today is faced with a lot of problems. Um, one of which is this one. I don't know if you got, if you if this happened to you last week. Some of you, this picture palang parang those horrifying memories of being stranded in Edsa for four hours. I have a friend 
who said um, left um, the place where he last left in Quezon City. He wanted to, he wanted to go to Malate area. He was stuck in Edsa until 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. And so because of the floods, because of the rains, and because of the horrible traffic that we have right now. I mean, this is just one of the issues of our nation today. Traffic, especially here in Manila. But how many of you know, poverty also is, in a, is a problem. Not just poverty, but right now, the Philippines is one of the leading exporters or uh, uh, child trafficking is so prevalent now here in the Philippines. We have problems in, 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 in our economy. We have problems in several facets of our society today. And so a good question that a lot of people are asking is this. Is there still hope for our nation? Is there still hope for the Philippines? And next year, we're going to be electing a new president. Next year, we're praying. I'm sure you're all praying that we get a good president that will help us, you know, grow as a people. But can I just say, can I just... Can I just, you know, just present this to you? I believe it takes more than one person to change this nation. The destiny of this nation can be rewritten. The destiny of this nation can be redirected if as a generation, we will shepherd, we will take care of the next generation so that we can change the history of this nation. See, it takes a Christ-following generation to reshape the history of a nation. Just as much as it takes only one generation to put the destiny of a nation down south, it also takes one generation to change the, nation, the, the destiny of a nation towards God's plan for that nation. That is why we need to reach young people. And so the question is, how do we do that? As a businessman, how can you do this? Maybe as a mom, you're asking, how can I take part in, you know, in, in discipling the next generation? As, a, as an educator, as a call center agent, as, a, as an ambassador to some place, as a businessman, what is your role and how can you practically do this? And so this is what we'll answer for the remainder of our time. And our text um, for today is in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. This is about Paul and Timothy. And Timothy um, is um, a young believer. He's about 17 years old. And Paul, at this time, he was about fifth in his 50s. Okay? And so this is what it says in verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because the of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Three keys on how we can disciple the next generation. Number one is this. Speak well to them. Speak well of them. In verse 2, we see that happening. It says there, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. This was pertaining to Timothy. And as I mentioned earlier, Timothy at this time is about 17 years old. Very young. And so as a young person, you can really say that guy is, can, has a lot of immaturities perhaps. Maybe, you know, in terms of responsibility, not as responsible because he's still a teenager. But yet it is interesting that in a society wherein young people are not given as much weight or value as the elder people, this man, Timothy, is being given the value or even spoken of very well. You see, in terms of young people, sometimes it's very easy to look at the faults of the young people. Um, nowadays, when you hear people talk about the next generation, some of the words that they use to describe the young people, irresponsible. Some say the young people are unreliable. They're only concerned with their gadgets. Some people, they think of young people as, a, you know, an irritation. Because of the generation gap, perhaps somehow they cannot relate to the kind of music of the young people. Um, last night, I was um, going around the facility and um, it so happened that we had a youth service here. And so I realized that, 
you know, I'm really getting older. <laughs> because when I was here, this whole place was packed with young people. The music was so loud. Young people were jumping up and down here. And so you can hear it from the ground floor. I mean, this building was really rocking. But yet when I was, you know, going around and I was hearing the noise, somehow in me it says, my eardrums are not equipped that much anymore, okay, to, to tolerate that kind of loudness. And so it really is irritating at times. But yet, God wants us to have eyes of faith whenever we look at the next generation. It, again, it is so easy to go with our natural eyes and look at what's wrong with the next generation. But how many of you know God has greatness stamped all over every young believer. Every young person in this world, God has a great destiny. In fact, if you will look at history, you will see the stamp of that. You will see a stamp of greatness among the young, okay? Let me start with this one. His name is George Westinghouse, okay? George Westinghouse, okay, he was, um, he was the one who invented the rotary steam en engine, okay? This, was, this is used in um, trains. And guess what? He invented it when he was 19 years old. In fact, one of his other inventions was a um, compressed air system wherein it's used for, um, you know, the brake system in, in locomotives so that when they, even from high speed, they can brake easily and safely. That was because of this man, George Westinghouse, Westinghouse at age 19. This guy, Philo Farnsworth, okay? Because of this man, we now have the television. How many of you can imagine life without television? <laughs> hey, this is hard perhaps for some of us. Perhaps some of us won't even survive without it. But this guy started that idea when he was 14. Any one of you here, you're 14 years old? Wow, okay. Yung totoo lang, okay. <laughs> this guy invented or at least conceptualized in his mind, okay, when he was 14 years old. Louis Braille, okay. This man, of course, you know him as the one, as the father of the Braille system for those who are, who are blind. But when it happened because when he was 15, he got accidentally blind, uh, he was blinded when he was 15. And as he was trying, he was being taught to read a book with embossed letters, big letters at that. And he said, it's difficult. This system is difficult. And so blinded he is, he invented the Braille system and which is being used all over the world today to help those who can't see so that they'll be able to read and be educated at the age, again, of 15. This man, okay, many of you are familiar with him. Started Facebook, 19 years old. This guy, okay, Jack Andraka, okay. Um, this guy is uh, all over the world, you know, since this man invented uh, something in 2011. Um, prostate cancer oftentimes is detected only when it's already in the late stages. And so the chances of survival for those with prostate cancer is very slim. Until this boy discovered a way to test patients with possible prostate cancer even in the very early stages. Guess what? He discovered it when he was 15. And so imagine what God can do through young people. You know, these other two guys, YouTube makers Chad Hurley and Steve Chen, when they were 26 years old, okay, 26 years old, Google bought YouTube from them for $1.6 billion. Wow. 26 pa lang. See, greatness is stamped in every young person. Every young person can be great. But the question is, are we able to see greatness behind the irresponsibility? Are we able to see past the you know, the irresponsibility and immaturities at times. Can we see through eyes of faith? And not just see, but can we speak life to them? Can we speak destiny to them? See, the Bible says in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. As parents here, I want to ask you, by faith, 
speak life, speak destiny to our children. For those of us here who are teachers, be a teacher who would speak life to your students. For those of us, you know, who are businessmen, maybe you have young employees in your, in, in your company, speak life to the next generation because God has greatness stamped in them. Next point, Acts 16 verse 3. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him. What does it mean? Okay. Another practical way that we can, so we can disciple the young people is to take them in. Okay. Take them in. What does it mean to take them in? 2 Timothy 2.1. You therefore, my son, this is Paul addressing Timothy. When you say take them in, it means be a father or a mother to them. See, it's one thing to be a coach. It's another thing to be a teacher. But being a father or a mother to the next generation is in a whole different ballgame. It is easy to teach someone it is easy to tell them what they should do. It is easy to tell them what needs to be done and what they should not be doing. But it's one thing altogether. It's another thing altogether if you do that out from a heart of a father, out of a heart of a mother. See, I, I've learned that because I, was, I'm, I have three kids myself. And just on my way here, on my way here, um, 20 minutes from Marikina and um, Sunday kasi, no? so walang traffic. And so in those 20 minutes, you go to about 20, 19 minutes of that, they were just, and they were just chatting, they're so loud, and actually it can be very irritating. And there, were very, there are a lot of opportunities I could have been irritated with my kids, but guess what? I'm the dad. And by some miracle, God has given me the grace. <laughs> by some miracle, God has given my wife the grace to be a parent to them. You see, there's a different grace that God gives us if we see the young people through the lens of a father and a mother. There will be a different grace in your life if your, your perspective is from a father or a mother of the next generation. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, speaking of teachers, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That is why I want to encourage you. Yes, let's speak well of the young people, but I hope for those of us who are 25 and up to have the posture and the heart of a father for the next generation. Lastly, Acts 16 verse 4. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them uh, for observance of decisions that had been reached by, uh, reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. See, Paul was supposed to deliver a very important message to the church at that time. But I want to highlight these words. It says there, they, there, and they. What does it mean? After Paul took Timothy in, it was no longer about Paul's ministry. It is now about the ministry of Paul and Timothy. It is no longer about the current generation it is now about the current generation plus the next generation. What are we saying here? For us to empower, uh, for us to reach the next generation, we need also to have a heart that will empower the next generation. Give them opportunities. Give them platforms so that they can thrive. Um, I, I remember this story, and this is the story of two dads. And they, have to, they happen to be carpenters. See, one dad... Um, as a carpenter was tasked to build a prison, was tasked to be part of those that will build a prison. And the other dad, the other carpenter, he was tasked to build pulpits for preachers. By some irony, what happened is their kids, when they grew up, the carpenter who made the prison, one of his kids ended up in that prison. And the carpenter who made pulpits, one of his child, children also became a pastor. And so as the present generation, we actually have a choice. Are we going to build prisons for the next generation? Or are we going to build pulpits for the next generation so that they can thrive, so that they can fulfill the destinies that God has for them? Um, when I was starting in ministry, um, I started when I was 23 years old. 
And so I've been a pastor or a campus missionary for about 12 years now. But when I started, I looked much younger. Um, I didn't have this before. And I was very thin at that time. Okay, ganun kasi pag kinakasal ka na, di ba, medyo lumalaki ka ng konti. And so at, the moment, at that time when I was a campus minister in 2003, I was invited to speak in an assembly of teachers. And so uh, it's a retreat for teachers, if I remember correctly. And I was one of the guest speakers. In fact, I think I was the main guest speaker. And so when I entered the hall, I was so shocked because there's a lot of teachers way older than me. And so as I entered it, one teacher even asked me, um, excuse me, are you the one who's going to fix the PowerPoint? Are you the one who's going to fix the screen? And so I just said, okay, I'll make sure that it gets fixed, okay? So, and then the, the organizer of the event suddenly grabbed the mic, welcomed everyone, and introduced me as the guest speaker. And when I stood on that stage, everyone was silent. And then when everyone was silent, because, I mean, one even whisper, I heard the whisper because it was so silent. Sabi ng isa, bata naman ng bata, ng sudya, napaka-totoy naman ng ano natin. Speaker that and they were saying I was so young, and so of course I, I you know I, I I tried my best to give the message from the Word of God, but at that moment I realized I needed to grow a beard. <laughs> so from that time on I developed this okay, so that I would look older, and not just that, but I even tried to have that you know that 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 daddy belly, <laughs> just so that I would look older. Because in our society, I guess. The more, uh, the more, uh, the older you are as a pastor, somehow they would listen to you more. Okay, but I'm just so glad we are part of a ministry that trusts young people. I'm so glad that we are part of a ministry that we have campus missioners, upcoming pastors like James Macariola. Nanto ka na bro? Twenty six years old. Come on, let's give a give a hand to Jeffrey James. I'm so glad that we are part of a movement that entrusts young people like the ones who sang earlier to lead worship in a congregation like this. Why? Because we believe in empowering the next generation. And so if you are here, you are part of this current generation. Can I just ask you, speak life to the next generation. Speak well of the next generation. As much as you can, take them in as a father or mother in the faith. And finally, give them opportunities. Empower them. Enable them to have those platforms so that they can be propelled to the destiny that God has for them. If a person would choose to speak life instead of ill and see past the irresponsibility and those hang-ups, and not just speak life but also to, to father a young person and give them, you know, hope, speak Jesus to them and give them platforms. See, now Lester is one of our fruitful youth pastors in the whole of Metro Manila. He's pastoring our um, services in Market Market and, you know, the services there are packed. The point is, now in this generation, if you are here and you're part of this generation, again, I want to challenge you. If you consider this church as your church, I'd like to ask you, pray to God, pray to God, and, and ask Him to give you the grace to speak life, to speak well of the next generation. Not just that, but give you a lens of a father and a mother. And not just the lens of a father and mother, but also give you ways to give the next generation, maybe it's your son, maybe it's your daughter, opportunities for them to shine as well. Amen? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. God, Lord, thank you for this time and thank you for every single person here. Lord, thank you that you've given us a, a mission. You've given us a responsibility, God, to help this generation and the next generation and the generation after that be followers of you. Father, Lord, thank you that whatever we are doing currently, whatever job assignment we have, 
whatever response, whether we're a housewife, whether we are, Lord, a businessman, an educator, no matter what you've called us to be in at this time, Lord, thank you that there will always be opportunities that we can reach and disciple the next generation. Thank you, Lord, that there's grace as well. You know, I just want to pray for um, a group of people. I want to ask the parents here in this room. If you're a parent, I'd like for you to stand up. And I'd like to pray for you. Discipleship starts from our homes. Our first assignment as parents, they are our kids. And I just want to pray grace to be upon every single one. I know it's hard. I'm a parent too. That's why I want to ask, invoke the grace of God to be upon every single one of us, even for those of you who are in the overflow room, and those watching in the live stream. Can you just bow your heads? I'd like everyone who is, seating, uh, who is seated to just stretch out your hands towards our parents here. Father, Lord, we speak a blessing to every parent here in this room, even those watching us on a live stream. Lord, thank you. Even now, Jesus, Lord, your hand is upon them. And Lord, you are bestowing grace. Lord, you're bestowing wisdom. Lord, you're bestowing strength. Lord, at times, our patience has been tested. Our love has been tested. Our ability to be good parents has been tested in so many ways. But Lord, thank you, there is always grace. And even tonight, or even this, this day, God, Lord, thank you that you are bestowing a fresh grace, Lord God, upon every single dad and mom here, even every single grandparent here in this room. Father, thank you that you are giving us all fresh grace, Lord, to represent you to our children in a way that would properly represent our Heavenly Father. Thank you that as they look at how we relate with them, Lord, they would see you as well in our lives. God, Lord, thank you that that is possible and nothing is impossible with God. No matter whether we're coming from a, you know, a, a bad start no matter if we're coming from a relational dysfunction at this time, Lord, thank you by faith in Jesus' name. We declare, Lord, there will be grace for us to raise the next generation in the way that you want us to. Thank you, Lord, for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'd like for us to all stand up. If you're a young person here, just lift up your hand. All the young people. If you're not lifting up your hand, can you just, you know, let, stretch out your hands towards them? Lay your hands upon their young people in this room. Even those in the overflow, there in the balcony. If you're beside someone who's young, okay, or someone who looks young, okay. lay your hands on them and we're going to declare a blessing over them. Father, we thank you for every young person here in this room. Even now, Lord God, we just declare... Lord, let your power be made manifest in their lives more and more. Father, thank you that they will be a very smart generation. Lord, we thank you that they will be a very, they will be a very prosperous generation, oh God. Lord, thank you that excellence will be their mark. Lord, thank you that they will be ten times better even with their peers, Lord God. The mark of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord God, it will be with them, oh God. Even as they hold on to you, even as they love you more, even as at a young age, Lord God, they grab hold of you, Jesus. Lord, there's no telling what you will do, Lord God, in and through them. And so we're just excited and we just commit the next generation to you, God. We speak blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.